So we welcome everybody to this installment of our Igniting the Inclusive uh, Workforce series. Uh, I'm really excited uh, for today's session on safeguarding benefits when seeking and during employment. We have uh, a great group of uh, experts uh, to share their, uh, their thoughts and their conversation with you, but you also have an opportunity to ask them questions. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to, first of all, thank you, and also to share a thank you to our continuing sponsors. Um, those are uh, Disability Inn of Greater Atlanta, uh, Georgia Tech's Institute for Leadership and Social Impact, as well as the Excel program at Georgia Tech. And uh, we also received a very generous funding from Atlanta Foundation. And we have a, a wonderful uh, schedule, which we will uh, speak to you about after this session. But at this point, I wanted to turn things over to uh, one of BDI's uh, employees and one of my uh, trusted colleagues, uh, truly is a navigator uh, for people who are living with disabilities, but a champion for people of all abilities. So with that, I will switch things over to BDI's Director of Benefits Navigation, Anna Mackey. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm delighted that we're having this conversation. And as you know, as a, as a Director of Benefits Navigation, the whole process of acquiring benefits is kind of challenging and making sure that we're safeguarding those benefits is even more challenging. So having the opportunity today to bring together two of my favorite people to, to share their insights and their expertise and perspective, I think is a wonderful opportunity for all of us. So I'm very pleased to introduce first Kim Martin. Kim is an attorney with the law firm of Nadler Beerneth, and she's bringing her expertise to talk about futures planning and for individuals who are transitioning into adulthood with an emphasis on social security benefits. I'm also pleased to introduce Philip Woody, who is a advocate and is also bringing the parent perspective to this. We, as a parent as well, uh, we all know how challenging it is to juggle all these myriad of responsibilities. Turning 18 is sort of a watershed year, and there's a lot of things that we need to be doing and making sure that we're doing the right thing for our, our loved ones as it relates to benefits and planning for a future that involves as much independence and as much employment as possible is really important. Um, so I know we have a lot to cover and not a whole lot of time, and I know you're gonna have some questions. So I'm, I'm strongly encouraging you to use the chat box. We're gonna be checking in that chat box to pull out some questions as we go through the session today. Um, this is not gonna be like a formal presentation. We really were hoping to have a, a family conversation. Kim, Philip, and I, we're all parents of individuals who have disabilities, and we want to make sure that we're doing the right things for them and sharing our expertise with you. So we're just going to have a conversation today, and we do have some slides that we're going to show um, as a backdrop and guide to our conversation. Um, but at this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Kim. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And um, first, I just want to thank Todd for organizing this whole series of conversations. It was just an unbelievable amount of work, and I just think it's a tremendous accomplishment that he got it done. Also, Katie did a beautiful job of polishing our slides, and she made this so easy for me. I feel very spoiled. So thank you both for everything that you've done to make this happen. And Anna and Philip are both just amazing resources. It's so exciting to be here and so great that we all get to sit and talk to each other, even if we're not in the same room. Um, so as Anna said, I'm an attorney at Nadler Biernap and I specialize in special needs planning, which is a combination of benefits planning and estate planning. And so that is all dovetailing a lot with what we're gonna talk about today. I am also a special needs mom. My son Finn is 14 years old and he has autism. And he's the reason that I do the work I do and the reason that I am here today. Um, today's talk 
is basically about how to keep your child employed and qualified for benefits at the same time. Um, before we get into that, I have to give you a couple disclaimers. So one of them is that this talk is being recorded and if you are watching this talk sometime later than October, 2020, just be aware that some of these numbers are gonna change over time. And some of the rules that we're talking about today may not be the same by the time you're watching this talk. So before you take any action that's based on anything that we say today, just um, be sure that you're acting on current information. So also, this talk is for general educational purposes only. It is not legal advice. So nothing that I say today is legal advice, even though I am a lawyer. I am not speaking on behalf of any local, state, or federal agency, including Bobby Dodd. And the information that you get today, while we hope it will be helpful, is not intended to be a substitute for a visit one-on-one -on -one with an attorney who can help you with your specific situation. Because all of this planning is incredibly fact-specific. And there, there are very few general rules that apply to everybody. And general rules are pretty much what we're going to be talking about today. Um, I believe that Philip is going to begin the presentation by talking about his work as a parent advocate. And he's, he's also going to talk to us about employment from a parent's perspective. Right. Very good. Thanks, Kim. And uh, it's been great working with uh, both you and Anna, you know, over the past uh, couple of years. And uh, I think we've done a lot of good work for the community together. And as a parent of a special needs child over the past 20 years, we've had to um, navigate you know, different services at different ages. For example, as an infant or a toddler, you know, uh, at that age, we were so focused on Katie Beckett uh, deeming waiver and getting the waiver. And then when our son started school, it was all about IEPs and therapies and insurance and uh, fighting to get on the, wait, the waiting list for the now comp waiver and then continuing to try to fight to get the waiver. And, um, and then on to setting up wills and special needs trusts, you know, account for Evan's disability and his future to make sure he's got a good quality of life, you know, through the end of his life. And, um, you know, there's always been something at every stage. And now that he's over 18, he's 21 right now, um, you know, we have guardianship and he's about to age out of school. And uh, we're looking at the possibility ability of employment. So for all of the services and benefits that we fought for for our children, you know, it's now on us again to advocate for our families, and for our children with disabilities uh, when it comes to employment and um, ensuring that we, that we maximize our children's benefits and we keep those benefits once they get employed. And so that we don't inadvertently, you know, lose some of those benefits because of all of the, you know, employment requirements and regulations that you'll hear from Kim. You know, we can't let it overwhelm us, um, but we have to stay on top of it. Um, so, so I think that's real important. And we don't want our children's employment, um, you know, should they find it to impact their benefits uh, that they're entitled to. So, you know, like I said, we fight like crazy for it. And it seems like a daunting task uh, to stay on top of you know, all the benefits that are available to them, you know, and then you add in employment. Um, so we just need to make sure that we stay on top of it um, because we still have responsibilities for our children, our families, and our work. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, advocacy at, at the state level, not just advocating and, and taking care of our family when it comes to employment and, and the benefits and regulations and requirements, but also, you know, make sure that you continually um, engage at the Georgia state government level for employment programs of all types that benefit our children and make sure you know your legislators. I think, you know, you know, most of us have um, uh, reached out to our legislators. And if you haven't, please do uh, understand where they stand on the different employment uh, programs. <clears throat> what do they stand for? So that you can influence them, so that you can educate them, enable them on, you know, what's important to us. Uh, so that you can decide whether or not to support that legislator and uh, determine whether or not you're going to vote for them. And um, so, you know, bottom line is, you know, it's, in critically, uh, it's critically important to, to stay on top of all the changes that go on because, as Kim said, 
it's not going to be static. Everything that we talk about today could change tomorrow, could change after the election, and that's real important. Uh, mm -hmm. But the last thing I'll say is um, make sure that you also not just go to your legislators and the different agencies at the state, but I think it's also important in any movement, and there are a lot of social movements happening right now that we're all very aware of, is to build your network of allies, neurotypical allies, because we can't do it all ourselves. And like I said, and like you've all experienced, we have families, we have work, we have our children to take care of on a daily basis. So make sure that you reach out to those you know, neurotypical allies because we need them to be able to help speak for us. So that's just a, that's, that's a little good. starter there for you, Anna and Kim. Yeah, that's an incredible start to, to our program. And you know, I, I think when you're building that network of support, I think you have an opportunity to include uh, employment opportunities with that. You know, some of the, the best employment opportunities for our guys is likely going to be with individuals that we know that we can help to negotiate that, that position uh, for that person. So having that network is incredible on all fronts. What a great point. Yeah, can I add uh, one other thing too, is that, you know, leverage the resources that are out there, leverage Bobby Dodd. Anna Mackey and Bobby Dodd have been fantastic over the past year. Uh, we worked with Kim around, um, you know, wills and special needs trusts. And these are things that we just could not navigate, you know, without them. They would just, they probably wouldn't happen and the end result would not be good. So we appreciate, you know, those resources. Reach out to them. They're there. Thank you. All right. So I guess before we can really even begin to talk about employment or benefits or anything else, we have to start by understanding the terminology that we have to use here. I hate using the word disability, um, but we have to in this case because it has an actual definition that we all need to know as step one to making sure that our child is qualified to get all these great benefits that we're gonna talk about later in this presentation. So there is a legal definition of what, what it means to be disabled. And what it means is that you have a condition that's more or less permanent, it's not gonna go away, and um, it, it can either be a physical or a mental impairment or both that prevents you from engaging in what's called substantial gainful activity. That's abbreviated often as SGA, or I guess that's the acronym for it is SGA. So substantial gainful activity is essentially your ability to work and to earn a certain amount of money. And that dollar amount changes every single year. But for this year, 2020, if, you, if your disability is blindness, then you are determined to be unable to engage in substantial gainful activity if you cannot earn more than $2,110 a month. For everybody else, the SGA limit is $1,260 a month. So if you have a child who is working either, you know, maybe, maybe full-time, but for you know, not very high hourly pay, or maybe, you know, erratic numbers of hours, if they're, if they're getting close to that SGA number, you know, if they go over it once, that's not the end of the world, but if they show that they can consistently earn more than this substantial gainful activity number, they will no longer meet the statutory definition of disabled, which means they won't qualify for SSI or SSDI or Medicaid or Medicare or any of the other kind of ancillary benefits that are out there. Um, although, and maybe Anna can address this a little because this is more in her wheelhouse than mine. I know that if you're participating in a work program, sometimes those rules get relaxed for a certain amount of time. Like if you're doing a supported work type of a program as opposed to just having a straightforward job that isn't supported work. It, it really depends. If they're working in a position and earning, and those earnings are reported, if those earnings have any deductions made, then that's always going to be viewed as countable income. There are some programs that my son um, is 
in a program that includes sort of a, an enclave type work and the paycheck that he gets while not remotely approaching the SGA, um, even though it would be viewed as countable income because it's not reported, they're not taking any taxes out of it. Um, their social security is not really that interested in it because it's fairly nominal, but that's usually the exception rather than the rule. The, what I would encourage folks to do is anytime your loved one starts to work is you need to make sure that you report that immediately to social security and that you are keeping track of those pay stubs and those earnings. Okay. And so once you have been determined to be disabled for the purposes of our of benefits qualification, that's when you can begin to pursue public benefits. And there are two different types of public benefits, two different categories that we're gonna talk about today. There are welfare-based benefits and insurance-based benefits. So welfare-based benefits, the two big ones are SSI and Medicaid. Um, typically our kids, unless, unless the household resources in, of the whole family are extremely low, our kids are not going to qualify for any of these benefits except possibly by way of a waiver. So a lot of our, our little young people like my son is on Katie Beckett, which is a deeming waiver. It's a Medicaid waiver. Other than that type of situation, most of the time until you turn 18, your resources are, are considered to include whatever your family has. So you're not gonna qualify for SSI. Um, once you turn 18, you are considered to be a household of one for looking at your resources. So we no longer care what mom and dad have because they're not required to support you anymore. So even though you may be living with mom and dad, even though they may very well be providing even potentially all of the support that you get financially. Once you're 18, you're a household of one and we only care what you have. And that's when most of our kids qualify for SSI. But they have to meet a couple tests in order to determine whether they qualify. So they can't have more than $2,000 in non-exempt resources. They can't earn over the SGA limit, but assuming that they qualify, um, the maximum amount that you can get in SSI for 2020 is $783 a month. Um, and as I said, if you have more than $2,000 in non-exempt resources on the first day of any given month, you don't qualify for SSI. And your earnings have to be below the SGA limit. And then I think this 783 in countable income thing is here because of the, there's a dollar for dollar offset for income with regard to SSI. Um, I think we're gonna get to that slide later. But um, basically you qualify for SSI if you pass both the resource test, the means test and the income test. Um, Kim, I'd like to I'd like to mention one thing real quick on SSI. Um, so, you know, when you hit 18, it's not like automatically on day one of being 18, you get that $783. You know, it's a it's an application process. It's a review process, and from our experience, it took several months. And even then. Um, Social Security came back and said, no, we're not going to give you the full 783. We're only going to give you 500. And, you know, you know, God bless my wife. She fought and fought and fought to get that full $783 right. that she was entitled to. And we did not, uh, and Social Security did not go back and retroactive give us, um, you know, what he was entitled to. Well, and you probably got a one third offset you probably got less than the full 783 a month because if you were letting Evan live in your house and eat out of the refrigerator, just like we all do with our kids, even when they turn 18, that means that you were providing him with food and shelter for free. And that is called in-kind support and maintenance or ISM. And if social security decides that any, any source other than SSI or an ABLE account 
is providing somebody with food and shelter, they'll say, this person's getting in-kind support and maintenance. They're getting free food and shelter, and we're going to reduce their SSI benefit by a third. And so that's probably what happened. The way around that, it doesn't work 100% of the time, but a way to address this that I typically will advise people to, to do is, is to have a, a written agreement, a room and board agreement with your child. And then once you're charging them rent to live in their room and eat out of the refrigerator, then you're no longer providing them with in-kind support and maintenance. And that's how you get back up to the full 783 a month. So I'm guessing that that's probably what happened. I'm sure Anna has things to say about this. I send people to Anna for this all the time. Okay. Um, I actually do have um, an, an email that has a step-by-step -step how, to, how to address that one-third reduction. Um, and anybody who would like that, we can certainly, I put my uh, email address in the chat box there. So if you would like that email sent to you, I'd be happy to do so. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give the, can you believe we're already halfway through this session <laughs> warning? So I know we still have a, a number of, of topics to go through. So here mm -hmm. we go. Okay. So once you're on SSI in Georgia, that qualifies you to get Medicaid which is medical insurance. It's, you're automatically eligible. You just go to Medicaid and say, here I am, I'm on SSI, and you, you apply essentially just to get a Medicaid card. Um, there are lots of different kinds of Medicaid. I believe there are seven different kinds, so it's hard to just talk about Medicaid like it's all one thing. Um, but the type of Medicaid that you'll be getting if you're on SSI is just essentially medical coverage, which is Medicaid is a payer of last resort, which means if your child is on your private family insurance, then Medicaid still expects for the family insurance to go first when it comes time to pay for something. And then if there's some amount left, like a copay, or if there's something that private insurance won't cover, Medicaid will pay for it as long as you're using a Medicaid approved provider. Uh, I think we've talked about, okay, so this is the income test. Income from any source, it doesn't have to be earned income, will offset SSI dollar for dollar. They'll disregard the first $20 every month because that's considered a personal allowance. But then if your child has income from a job, if your child is, is still being supported with child support, if you're divorced, this is something a lot of people don't know, that child support is attributed to the child as income, even if it's getting paid to a parent. And that will, that will offset SSI and therefore reduce SSI dollar for dollar. Um, SSDI, which we haven't gotten to yet, but SSDI has a different set of rules about income. And if you're on SSDI, the only type of income they're interested in is earned income. So unearned income from things like uh, child support or payments from a trust or whatever are, don't affect SSDI at all, but they can affect SSI. So the resource test, which is also known as the means test, also only applies to SSI. SSDI doesn't care whether you have more than $2,000 in non-exempt resources, but if you're on SSI and you have more than $2,000 in non-exempt resources on the first day of the month, you're going to lose SSI for that month. And that's another great reason to have that room and board agreement, because if you're charging your child rent, then the SSI money goes into probably a rep payee account. So a parent typically would be the representative payee. They'd have a bank account with their name on it and the child's name on it. And the money goes in there and then you can pay yourself rent and, and keep the balance in that account fairly low and, and, keep it below $2,000. So insurance-based benefits are the other type of benefits that we were going to talk about today. Um, the two big ones here are SSDI and Medicare. Um, eligibility for these benefits is based on your work record. So if you're a disabled adult and you have a work history, it's possible to get SSDI in one of two different ways. One way that you can get SSDI is it's based on your own work record. So this, it, it's, it's hard to give you a, a hard number here because it depends on so many different things. Right, right, right. Um, but if you have enough quarters of work 
and you become disabled to the extent that you can no longer work, then it's possible that you could get SSDI based on your own work history. The better way, in my opinion, to get SSDI is the second way, which is by way of a parent's work record. So if you have a disability that began before you reached age 22 and you're on SSI, and then you have a parent who either dies or becomes disabled themselves and starts to draw benefits or retires and begins to draw social security, any of those things will cause you to go from SSI to SSDI. And then you're getting SSDI based on a parent's work record, which means you're very likely getting more money. So the way that we figure out how much SSDI you're going to get under those circumstances is the rule of thumb is you'll get about half of whatever the parent gets. So if you have a parent who retires and they're getting $3,000 a month in social security and you're the disabled child, you'll likely go from SSI to SSDI and you'll get about $1,500 a month in SSDI. So that's way more than the current $783 a month of SSI. And you then can just stop worrying about a lot of these really troublesome, annoying tests that you have to worry about with SSI. So two years after you go on SSDI, you will also be eligible for Medicare as opposed to Medicaid. So SSDI and Medicare are both not means tested, but we still care about the means test. We always, always care about the means test because there are lots of different types of Medicaid. And even when your child is on Medicare, you may want one of those types of Medicaid, which is very likely to be means tested. So for example, there's a type of Medicaid that's called QBT Medicaid that will pay your monthly Medicare premiums if you qualify for it. That's just one example. And there's the big brass ring now waiver and comp waiver that are Medicaid waivers. So it is possible to be eligible for all four of these benefits at the same time or some combination of them. So if let's say that you're on SSI and you have a little work history and you've earned you know, something, but maybe not a lot, and then your disability prevents you from working any further. So you then go on SSDI based on your own work record. But because you don't have a really long work history or because your earnings were never very high, maybe you're getting $200 a month in SSDI. That doesn't mean you're now losing SSI and you're going from 783 a month to 200 a month. What that means is SSDI will pay you your 200 a month based on your work history, and SSDI will make up the difference. So you'll still end up getting a total of 783 a month. It's just that you'll get it from two different sources of Social Security benefits. And by the same token, if you're on SSDI and it's been two years and now you're on Medicare, as I was saying before, you very likely could still be on one or more Medicaid benefits assuming that you pass the means test. So we had, we, we made this slide because we just decided to be incredibly timely. And I hope that soon this will not be important anymore because COVID will be over. But at the moment, I have a lot of people asking me questions about this. Um, there were stimulus checks that went out a few months ago and who knows, maybe there will, or maybe there won't be more stimulus checks coming. Um, and a lot of my families that had young adults who were entitled to get these $1,200 checks were just in a panic because they didn't know, does this, is this going to count as income for SSI purposes? Is this $1,200 that's suddenly sitting in my child's bank account with no warning that's put him way up over his $2,000 limit going to disqualify him from all these means-tested benefits? What should we do about this? And Social Security, luckily, anticipated these questions and the way they answered them the last round of stimulus checks and hopefully the way that they will be answered this next round if there is one is that the payments are considered unearned income so obviously they would never have affected SSDI but they also didn't count those payments as 
any type of income for purposes of the SSI income test. So that's no problem. And they also said for six months after you get that stimulus payment, it is not considered a resource. So you have six months to get rid of it, spend it, put it into an ABLE account, do something with it so that it's not sitting in the bank account. So these are some resources that um, I, I'm sure that there's a way for somebody to see this later. Um, Anna, do you think this is going to be posted on the Bobby Dodd website or something? Because this slide has a lot of really useful places that people can check out. Right. What I'd like to do is pull together not only these resources, but some of the other handouts that um, I think if we were in a face-to-face -face environment that we might have distributed, but in the, a virtual setting, we may be able to send that after the fact. So. Okay. And Anna, can you talk a little bit about these first two and can you tell us the difference between the blue book and the red book? Sure. When, when I look at the blue book, the blue book is all about the categorical listings of disability. This is what you need to be focused on at that point of, of applying for disability. So you need to follow the specific criteria that Social Security is requesting to confirm the severity and impact of that disability such that you would get that determination of award. So the blue book is, you can just Google blue book and put in whatever condition and you can see if it's a listing by itself. There are some listings that are compassionate allowances and that are fast tracked through social security. Um, so it's, it's just an interesting thing to, to review. The red book is your guidebook for once you have benefits, whether it's SSI or SSDI, this opens the door to helping you understand how you manage those benefits when you're working. So it's, it's chock full of very important information, including incentivized programs like Ticket to Work, the importance of connecting with an organization that has the, the work incentives planning and assistance so you can manage your benefits. Um, it includes impairment related work expenses so that you would know if my child, if I'm paying out of pocket for medication or I'm paying out of pocket for transportation costs, then even though they're deducting countable income, they're going to take those receipts from those impairment related work expenses and put it right back in. So it's a really important tool to help you manage being able to maximize benefits um, while you're working. Great. Okay. And hey, Kim, so, I've got a question. Yes. No, go ahead. Well, I was just going to ask you. Sorry, we might be headed in a you question about, Yeah, I was going to ask you a question about guardianship and conservatorship, mm -hmm. and how those impact employment. Yeah, that's a that's a really great question, mm -hmm. and it's a really important point because. Age 18 is such a huge age for our kids. There are so many things going on. And one of the things that a lot of people address at age 18 is that, you know, if once, once you turn 18, legally, you're an adult and you have all the rights and abilities to get into trouble that every other adult has. And so at that point, a lot of parents start to, you know, begin the process to petition for guardianship. Mm -hmm. And in Georgia, guardianship and conservatorship are kind of two halves of the whole. Guardianship is care of the person, and conservatorship is care of the person's money. So if your child has a job, then you will need to petition for both guardianship and conservatorship. If your child doesn't have any assets and doesn't have any income other than SSI, you don't necessarily have to petition for conservatorship. And you know, if I had a choice about it, I would not petition for a conservatorship because it's, it's burdensome. Um, you have to post a bond with the court that you have to pay for. You have to file an annual accounting to the court every year, and you have to give a spending plan to the court. And once that spending plan is approved, you can't deviate from the spending plan without permission from the court. So that makes it problematic if your child you know, earns more than you thought they were going to earn that year and they get above $2,000 in their bank account and you can't get rid of the $2,000 because you're working under a spending plan that was approved, you know, at the beginning of the year. So it's, that's problematic, but um, just the, the kind of 
general advice I would suggest to people is if you're contemplating guardianship and conservatorship, just be aware that conservatorship can limit your ability to quickly get rid of money to keep your child qualified under the means test. So that's just an issue that you need to think about and be ready for when you, when you create a spending plan in any given year. Good. Thanks. So Kim, we've had a number of, of questions about the ABLE account. Do you want to just provide a little more information and clarity around why it's important to have an ABLE account? Sure. And, and you know, it's, it's not necessarily, it's not something that everybody should necessarily have, but it's a useful tool in certain ways. Um, an ABLE account, it, well, first of all, people are probably more familiar with the 529 college savings plans that have been around for a while. They're called 529 plans because they were created under Section 529 of the Internal Revenue Code. ABLE accounts kind of got shoehorned in to that code section. So ABLE accounts were created a few years ago, and they were created under Section 529A of the Internal Revenue Code. And an ABLE account is something that allows a disabled person to save money over and above the $2,000 in an account that is considered exempt for purposes of qualifying for benefits. So it's a great place to put, you know, relatively small amounts of money. There are limitations on ABLE accounts that make them, you know, not great if you, if you suddenly inherit a whole bunch of money or, you know, for some reason you have significantly more money than you're allowed to put in in a given year. But the limit that you can contribute to an ABLE account in any given calendar year is $15,000 unless you're employed. So if your child has a job and earnings from that job, then the, the, you can contribute the 15,000 plus whatever amount the child earned that year up to the federal poverty limit, which I believe is something like $12,700. So anything that you put into an ABLE account is exempt for purposes of passing that means test. The downside of having money in an ABLE account is that at, at the child's death, any funds that are in the account are gonna be subject to Medicaid payback. And the clock starts ticking on the Medicaid payback when you open the account. So, you know, I wouldn't, if you have a five-year-old who doesn't have any money and doesn't have any prospects of having any money, I would not open an ABLE account because you're gonna start that clock running on the Medicaid payback. Um, but it's a, it's a great place to just park a small amount of money until you need it for something. So, you know, if you've got a child whose earnings are building up in their bank account and you don't have any good reason to spend the money on anything, you know, maybe you want to open an ABLE account and say, this is going to pay for my child's plane ticket to go on the family vacation. Or, you know, this is going to pay for the new wheelchair that we were going to buy in six months or, or whatever it is. So I, I think we're about ready to wrap up. I didn't know if you had any other final comments to make to the group. Phil or Kim? Um, Phil, do you have anything? Um, well, go ahead, Kim. I'm just, I'm just, I just, when I'm, Happy to answer additional questions if anybody has any. Um, I think my contact information is in here somewhere and um, you can always email me at the firm if you have any questions. Um, yes. it's, it's very hard. I, I feel like we've just scratched the surface on so many things that we could have talked about all day, yeah. but hopefully at least we've introduced some, some ideas to people and, and given them things that they can find out more about. And I would just add, um, you know, what you mentioned at the beginning, Kim, and I, I mentioned it briefly as well, is that everything that you talked about today, you know, it's point in time. Mm -hmm. And it could change tomorrow, could change in November, sometime next year. Um, there are limits that we have to watch and um, benefits that are there that if we don't take advantage of them, they don't just drop in our laps. So, you know, we need, we need to be, um, you know, diligent in keeping track of all these. So. Right. I, agree. I would agree. And I would just add that benefits planning is a very individualized process. It's not a one size fits all. What's going to work for one person may not work for someone else. I strongly encourage everyone to have 
some level of support, whether it's through BDI or through WIPA, but to regularly check in with a benefits navigator because there, there's so many points that change. And, you know, when you're a busy parent, you have what's front and center. And then the next wave comes, you have to deal with that. So being able to have um, the go-to people, that network of support that you mentioned, Philip, earlier, how important that really is. Um, certainly BDI is proud to be a support to our community. So feel free to, to reach out to us. Um, reach out to the, the resources that you have here today. Um, we're delighted to be able to assist you in any way we can. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Anna and Philip and Kim um, and Katie, our, our project manager, um, for just a, a, an, an exceptional a wealth of information that was provided. I mean, as I think about uh, guardianship, conservatorship, uh, ABLE accounts, and uh, and how stimulus checks uh, affect everything, um, child support payments, uh, it, it's a lot to keep track of. And I know there's a uh, responsibility on, on um, the individual side and parent side, but we're so grateful to have such experts and, and strong advocates and, and champions uh, for those that really do need the navigation through all of this <laughs> to figure out what the best path is uh, for them. Um, thank you again. And uh, at this point, I just wanted to do some uh, promotion of our next uh, session, which will take place uh, Wednesday, October uh, 21st. We have Emily Myers from Briggs and & Associates and, and Ryan Carroll, who works at SHOA. They're going to be joining us uh, to share just uh, some great information on how to obtain job coaching. Um, but once again, thank you for joining us for this session on safeguarding benefits. Uh, we're so grateful for your participation. You kept Anna busy with all of the questions. <laughs> so we appreciate it. And, and please uh, take advantage of uh, their encouragement to reach out post-session for any questions that you might have. Um, we will be sending out a, um, a, uh, this recording, as well as uh, the invite to the next session if you've registered for the uh, series. So with that, um, have a great rest of uh, your day and thank you again. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.